The Shepherd's Monument in the grounds of Chakra Hall is romantic and mysterious. It's meant to be. It shows a marble relief copied from Poussin's famous painting of the Arcadian Shepherds, copied from an engraving so shown in mirror image. The shepherds stand by a tomb on which is inscribed, Et in Arcadia ego, I, death, am also in Arcadia, even in what seems to be a happy paradise. And below the relief is a more cryptic inscription, O-U-O-S-V-A-V-V, and below this, D and M. D-M is a common inscription on Roman funerary monuments. It stands for Dies Manibus, dedicated to the shades. The monument was part of a development of the gardens and house by Thomas Anson, beginning in the late 1740s. His friend, the botanist Thomas Pennant, wrote, He was wont often to hang over it in affectionate and firm meditation. Sir Thomas and Arthur Clifford of neighbouring Tixel pointed out that Pennant made no mention of the cryptic cipher. The meaning of these letters Mr. Anson would never explain, and they still remain an enigma to posterity. This enigmatic structure is the outstanding statement of an interest in Arcadia in 18th century England. But what does it mean? After 270 years, the question can be answered. When we look at the monument in its context, in the light of what we can discover about Thomas Anson and his friends, and of the Arcadian tradition, we can find that it has a message that is even more important today, and we too can rediscover Arcadia. The ancient Arcadia is almost forgotten by the writers who developed the literary and artistic tradition, but its myths are mysterious and fascinating. Arcadia is in the centre of the Peloponnese, the landmass, almost an island, which is the core of Greece. It was always seen as a wild place. It was the home of Hermes and Pan, the god of nature. The name comes from Arcas, a mythical king, who was the son of Zeus and the nymph Callisto. Jupiter seduced Callisto, according to Ovid, in the guise of Diana. Callisto gave birth to Arcas, Zeus's enraged wife Juno, turned Callisto into a bear. Zeus set Callisto in the heavens as the constellation, the Great Bear. This story, with its association with the constellation, which was so important to ancient cultures, and which points the way to the pole star, has very deep and mysterious echoes. Another Arcadian myth is that of the nymph Arethusa. Arethusa was pursued by the river god Alpheus from her home in Arcadia, underground, under the sea, to re-emerge in the form of a freshwater spring at Ortigia near Syracuse on the island of Sicily. The underground stream then links Arcadia with Sicily. Virgil tells this story in his Eclogues. The history of the idea of Arcadia begins on that island and not in the geographical Arcadia. The history of the poetic Arcadia, the pastoral paradise, begins on Sicily with the poet Theocritus. Theocritus is considered the inventor of Greek pastoral poetry. He was born on Sicily around 300 BC. He's believed to have later lived on the Greek island of Kos and in Egypt. He wrote poetry in various styles, and some of the work ascribed to him is probably by others, but his fame rests on a group of idyls, poems which are set in a rural setting. This is where the tradition of poetic shepherds begins. Though the first of Theocritus's idyls is a story told by a goat herd, Thersis about a herdsman Daphnis. 
Both these names would reoccur in later works in the pastoral tradition, from Virgil, who wrote about Daphnis, to the 19th century Matthew Arnold, who wrote an elegy to his friend Arthur Hugh Clough as Thyrsis in a setting of Victorian Oxford. In the first idyll, Aphrodite has made Daphnis suffer a passion for her which he would rather die than submit to. Other gods appear and question the suffering herdsman. Idyll 11 tells the story of the one-eyed Polyphemus' love for the sea nymph Galatea, which is mentioned in Homer's Odyssey and was elaborated by Ovid in his Metamorphoses. It became a popular story in the Renaissance and later in a serenata in the Arcadian style by Handel. The seventh idyll, set on Kos, describes a singing contest. This is the source of later Arcadian singing contests in which poets could write inappropriate pastoral forms, including the interludes or eclogues, which are an important feature of Sydney's Arcadia in the 16th century, nearly 2,000 years later. Virgil's eclogues can be seen as the key works of the Arcadian tradition and the inspiration of most of what followed in the next 2,000 years. Virgil lived in the last century BC. His eclogues allude to the political situation. This was the time after the assassination of Julius Caesar. They're not all set in Arcadia, some certainly not. The ten eclogues are varied in their mood and subjects. They seem to have been assembled as a unity. All their themes become irredeemably Arcadian. In the first eclogue, Melibius and Titurus are in the countryside, in exile, perhaps in Italy rather than Arcadia. Rome has been torn by civil war. In the second eclogue, an older shepherd, Corridon, wanders through the woods addressing in his mind the younger Alexis, a beautiful slave boy. Come here, O lovely boy, for you the nymph spring lilies look in baskets full. For you, the naiad fair, plucking pale violets and poppy heads, combines narcissus with them, and the flower of fragrant dill. Then, weaving marjoram in and other pleasant herbs, colours soft bilberries with yellow marigold. Myself, I'll pick the grey-white apples with tender down, and chestnuts, which my amaryllis used to love. I'll add the waxy plum, this fruit too shall be honoured. I'll pluck you, O oh, laurel, and your neighbour myrtle, for so arranged you mingle pleasant fragrances. Arcadia might be a retreat from war and the city, but it's not an escapist fantasy. Death is present in Virgil's Arcadia. In the fifth eclogue, the shepherds talk of making a tomb to the dead Daphnis, the legendary inventor of pastoral poetry, literally a tumulus or mound. And make a mound, and add above the mound a song, Daphnis am I in woodland, known hence as far as the stars, heard of a handsome flock, myself the handsome. The tenth eclogue refers specifically to Arcadia and the nymph Arethusa who links Arcadia to Sicily, where the real poet Virgil's friend Gallus has come suffering from unrequited love. It's the fourth eclogue which, in a few words, forever attaches the idea of Arcadia to the idea of the Golden Age, and, by accident, gave Virgil his reputation as a prophet of the Christian religion. To readers in later centuries, Arcadia would be a place associated with sacred mysteries. Now the last age of Cumae's prophecy has come. The great succession of centuries is born afresh. Now too returns the virgin. Saturn's rule returns. A new begetting now descends from heaven's height. O oh, chaste Lucina, look with blessing on the boy, whose birth will end the iron race at last, and raise a golden through the world. 
Now your Apollo rules. Yam reddit et virgo rediunt Saturnia regna. The age of Saturn was the time of the golden age when people lived in harmony. Virgil's virgin is Asfreya, goddess of justice, the divine law which is woven through nature, who, Ovid tells us, abandoned this world as humans became corrupted. The myths of Astraea and the Golden Age are now woven into the Arcadian tapestry. Virgil was writing about 40 BC at the time of the Treaty of Brundisium, which he hopes would end the civil wars. The boy he refers to is, in historical terms, assumed to have been a son and heir to Antony and Octavia. Within a few hundred years, this was read quite differently. The Emperor Constantine and Saint Augustine recognised Virgil as a prophet of the coming of Christ. Arcadia was sanctified. A thousand years later, in Dante's Divine Comedy, Virgil, the prophet of the coming of Christ, is the poet's guide through hell to the earthly paradise. This is Eden, but in a few lines, Dante weaves the Christian Eden forever into the Golden Age. Dante sees a lady, Matilda, walking on the other side of the river Lethe. A lady all alone who went along singing and culling floweret after floweret with which her pathway was all painted over. Jewels of classical mythology are set in this Christian scene. Thou makest me remember where and what Proserpina that moment was when lost her mother her and she herself the spring. As turns herself with feet together pressed and to the ground, a lady who is dancing and hardly puts one foot before the other on the vermilion and the yellow flowerets, she turned towards me. The bond between the earthly paradise and the Arcadian golden age is set in these lines. Those who in ancient times have feigned in song the age of gold and its felicity dreamed of this place, perhaps, upon Parnassus. Virgil smiles and then vanishes as a great procession leads in Dante's Beatrice, who will guide the poet into paradise. This Christian earthly paradise, with its rivers flowing from the centre of creation, has become the heart of an imaginal Arcadia, a place that exists in the soul more real than any geographical location. Not all Arcadias that followed have this deep sense of mystery and truth. In the Renaissance, Arcadia became a popular setting for pastoral poetry with Jacopo Sanazzaro's Arcadia, written in the 1480s and published in Naples in 1504. This work inspired a host of imitators. The poet is escaping the city life of Naples for the countryside to live with the shepherds. Sanazaru uses themes from Virgil, including the hope of the return of the Golden Age, but his Arcadia is simply an escape, ultimately unsatisfying, and in the end the poet returns to the city. Literary Arcadias can be a fantasy, as if the writers have no interest in real nature or real love. Others touch something deeper. The true Arcadia has a life of its own. The Golden Age desires to return. The imaginal longs to be united with the earthly, and the earthly world longs to be re-enchanted. Perhaps Sir Philip Sidney saw Arcadia in the parkland around Wilton House in Wiltshire, reading his book to his sister, the Countess of Pembroke. Sidney's lengthy book, partly inspired by Sanazaro, was posthumously published by his sister as the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia. What kind of book is it? It was written as a pastime and entertainment. It's largely about visitors to Arcadia and their complicated relationships. 
There's no magic or esoteric. It's a vast study in literary style, courtly language and virtue. Sydney tells us that Arcadia enjoys a singular reputation for the sweetness of the air and other natural benefits, but principally for the moderate and well-tempered minds of the people. The four eclogues which divide the prose story are showcases for poetical experiments, new ways of reviving the effects of Greek and Latin poetry. Sweet woods, the delight of solitariness, how much do I like your solitariness? Here no treason is hid, veiled in innocency, nor envious, sneaky eye finds any harbour here. There were many imitators of Arcadia in Elizabethan England. Elizabeth herself was equated with Estrella, the Virgin of Justice. It was an attractive escape. But for Sydney, poetry is a serious business. In his defence of poesy, he argued that poetry had its own truth. Nature never set forth the earth in so rich tapestry as diverse poets have done, neither with so pleasant rivers, fruitful trees, sweet-smelling flowers, nor whatsoever else may make the too-much-loved earth more lovely. Her world is brazen, the poets only deliver a golden. But poetry speaks of aesthetic truth rather than empirical truth. Poetry, he says, should be icastic, feigning forth good things, rather than fantastic in the sense of being unreal. The poet creates another world as co-creator with God. I would say that Arcadia can mean two things, parallel to Sydney's icastic and fantastic. Arcadia can sometimes mean a fantasy Arcadia, the unreal escapist world of shepherds and shepherdesses. But the Arcadia which has poetic truth is the imaginal Arcadia. This Arcadia is a place of well-tempered minds and simplicity or naturalness, in which we live according to the divine law of justice or harmony. But how does this Arcadia relate to the so-called real world? Can it be found here? Edmund Spencer's first published work, The Shepherd's Calendar, is a collection of 12 eclogues in an antique English style. As well as their seasonal concerns, the shepherds discuss political and religious issues of the Elizabethan age. His great and complex epic, The Fairy Queen, has spectacular set pieces exploring key themes of nature, which can be understood as aspects of the Arcadian myth. The Bower of Bliss in Book Two shows nature in a negative light when indulgence and sensuousness takes over. But the Garden of Adonis in Book Three is ideal, harmonious nature. Adonis, the shepherd loved by Venus, the celestial Venus who guides all things to harmony, represents matter. Adonis, or matter is, Spencer says, subject to mortality, yet is etern in mutability, and by succession made perpetual, transform it oft and change it diversely. Time is the enemy of nature, who with his scythe addressed does mow the flowering herbs and goodly things. Yet, as Spencer says in the Garden of Adonis, there is continual spring and harvest there, continual both meeting at one time. Matter changes, but form, which comes from Venus, is eternal. Spencer writes, in the numerologically significant, perhaps, Book 3, Canto 6, Stanza 12, of Venus's heavenly house, the house of goodly forms and fair aspects, whence all the world derives the glorious features of beauty. And in his four hymns, Venus is equated with the divine wisdom or sapience. 
These are ideas that lie in the shadows of what follows, and were certainly known to the 18th century circle, which I will come to later. In The Fairy Queen, the imaginary world, fairyland, has a mysterious relationship with this material world. In Book 3, it intersects with the legendary history of Britain. In the mutability cantos, which might be parts of an unfinished seventh book, the boundaries of the real and imaginary break down again. The poet places a great debate about the changeability of nature and eternity of nature's laws in the setting of his own home on Arlo Hill in Ireland. The imaginal Arcadia finds an earthly location in Honoré Durfé's very long romance, Astre. This is, in effect, a French equivalent of Sydney's Arcadia, but set in a real landscape, though in a distant, nostalgic past, the area of Foret, close to the author's country home. A very long series of stories is threaded into a plot in which the shepherdess Astre, her name is the goddess of justice referred to by Virgil, believes her lover Celadon has drowned in the river Lignon. In fact, he has been cared for by nymphs in their chateau. Also in the forest lives the druid Adamas, who explains to her that their Celtic deities are all aspects of one true god. The book was immensely popular also in England. It inspired the 17th century Puritan Platonist Peter Sterry, and it was enjoyed by Thomas Anson's sister-in-law Elizabeth by the river at Shugborough. Here is a window into a deeper and more mysterious Arcadia. Poussin painted this famous image at some point between 1638 and 1640. It was possibly one of three philosophical or moralistic pictures painted for Cardinal Rospigliosi in Rome. One, time-saving truth from envy and discord, is lost. The other is a dance to the music of time. The seasons dance, the world changes, lives, dies, lives again, and in the sky Apollo and the hours fly by. This is copied from a painting by Guido Reni. We will see it again. What is the moral of the Shepherds of Arcadia? Could this be the tomb of Virgil's Daphnis? Of course, death is present in the real Arcadia, and this calm, almost eerie landscape is utterly real, more than real. This is the perfect icon of the imaginal Arcadia. These are poetic shepherds, or shepherds who have been involved in sacred rites. They wear laurel garlands. And what of the shepherdess? The gaze of the shepherd in red draws us to her face. Poussin seems to have copied her from a Roman relief of Persephone, though this has no provenance before 1914. The similarity, even if coincidental, shows that she can justly be seen as a figure of divine authority. These shepherds show stoical acceptance of death, but she perhaps knows deeper wisdom. The image has haunted us for 400 years. The pastoral style was a commonplace in Baroque music. Operas might take place wholly in a pastoral setting or have a pastoral episode as a contrast to more weighty happenings. By 1700, the principal supporter of the pastoral style was the Arcadian Academy in Rome. This was begun by Queen Christina of Sweden, who had abdicated, converted to Catholicism, and went to Rome. It was a society of aristocracy and senior clergy, princes and cardinals. The members took on Arcadian codenames, devoted to preserving a literary and musical style that was free from Baroque excesses. Nothing was for show that a drama should be true to life. The Academy attracted the best musicians, Corelli and Alessandro Scalati, and the young Handel. The Arcadian ideal was of simplicity, truth to nature, 
Music could be influenced by Italian folk music, like Shepherd's pipe tunes. Corelli used one in his Christmas concerto. The simplicity of this music allowed space for inspiration to break in, divine poetic furor. This is a long way from the intellectual complexity of German music, most obviously Bach. A pause could be as dramatic or as sublime as a grand climax. This music could embrace the darker passions. Some cantatas are about abandoned lovers singing of death in dark forests. One, by Handel, sets words by his patron, Cardinal Ottoboni, praising the composer himself as Orpheus. The divine musician Orpheus is also part of the imaginal Arcadia. Handel took the spirit of Arcadia with him to London. One of his first operas for London was Il Pastor Fido from the very influential 16th century Arcadian play by Guarini. His setting of Milton's poems L'Allegro and Il Penseroso, The Cheerful and the Melancholy Soul, written at suggestion of the philosopher James Harris, translated Arcadian feeling into a very English landscape. But the Arcadian ideas affect all his music, which combines Italian feeling with German intellect. But the 18th century was a new world. The ancient cosmos had been replaced by an infinite universe. In many places, including England, God and the sacred had been detached from the world. Nature or creation was ours to exploit. The idea of Arcadia could be treated with suspicion for associations with the beautiful slave boys, Italians, Catholics. In the same way, Plato was rarely talked about in England. This is true, and a reason why the second half of this story, the appearance of Arcadia in Staffordshire, is far more remarkable than it might at first appear. Here is the imaginal Arcadia with its deeper mysteries. The place is a setting for serious philosophy and a gateway for our return to real physical Arcadias. Thomas Anson was born in 1695. He was the son of a London lawyer who had bought the estate at Shugborough in the centre of England in the late 17th century. Thomas's brother, George, famously sailed around the world in the 1740s in pursuit of a Spanish treasure ship and became an admiral and an important reformer of the Navy. Thomas was very private, but occasionally very funny. He excelled in badinage and dry wit. I think there are two driving forces in his life. The inspiration of Sir Isaac Newton and an exceptional love for the classical world, which made him an adventurous traveller, though he seems to have rarely spoken about his journeys. Thomas was brought up with close links with Sir Isaac Newton. His uncle was Thomas Parker, the first Earl of Macclesfield, Lord Chancellor and a friend of Newton. His cousin, the second Earl, was a mathematician and astronomer who built up a very important library at Sherburne Castle. Thomas's own library includes a first edition of Newton's Principia. It's likely that Thomas's tutor was William Jones, one of Isaac Newton's associates and the inventor of the mathematical symbol pi. When Thomas joined the Royal Society in 1730, his proponents or proposers were William Jones and Zachary Pierce, who had assisted Newton in his work on the chronology of the ancient biblical kingdoms. Newton might seem remote from the world of Arcadia, but to those who revered him in 18th century England, he was not seen as the arch-materialist as William Blake saw him later, but as someone who was seeking the divine law, the harmony within all nature. There are very few clues to Thomas's travels. He rarely talked about them. There's some evidence that he was a spy. The philosopher James Harris, who campaigned against the fashion in favour of Platonic philosophy, recorded a priceless anecdote 
This was in 1734. When the late Mr. Anson, Lord Anson's brother, was upon his travels in the east, he hired a vessel to visit the Isle of Tenedos. His pilot, an old Greek, as they were sailing along, said with some satisfaction, there twas our fleet lay. Mr. Anson demanded, what fleet? What fleet, replied the old man, a little piqued at the question, why our Grecian fleet at the siege of Troy? This story was told the author by Mr. Anson himself. Virgil tells of the Greek fleet hidden at Tenedos in the Aeneid. Thomas had stood at a site which played a part at the very beginning of Greek history and culture. A poem written in Thomas's honour by the Reverend Sneed Davis in 1750 seems to have been the product of conversations with him now in retirement in his gardens at Shugborough. The poem mentions travels to the river Elysus in Athens, where Socrates discusses love in Phaedrus, Cairo, and the desert cities of Palmyra and Baalbek. Thomas began to develop his home as a place of retirement, a gentleman's villa in the style of Pliny, in the 1740s. He added a library and drawing room to the original 17th century house and laid out the gardens with water features and a series of monuments, or we might say follies. The extensions to the house were complete by 1748 when Thomas's brother George and his wife Elizabeth visited but other buildings were added to the landscape over the next few years. Like William Kent's work at Rauschen ten years earlier, I see this as an integrated plan. There is a unified message in the gardens, monuments and house. Thomas might have been private or secretive, but this is his Arcadian Testament, leading us to ideas that were very much against the grain of the materialist 18th century. Shagpra itself is a locus aminus. This is an Arcadian landscape. It stands at the confluence of two rivers, the River Sau and the River Trent, in a valley that sheltered, distinctly separate from the rising wilderness of Canic Chase to the west. Just across the river is Tixall, the home of Walter Aston, dedicatee of John Fletcher's The Faithful Shepherdess and patron of the poet Drayton. One of Thomas's neighbours at Tixall built a Gothic bridge. This has an inscription almost hidden from the passerby, Hic ver perpetuum, here is eternal spring, the classic statement of the Golden Age. Only a few miles away is Chartley Hall, where Sir Philip Sidney is said to have met his muse Stella, Penelope Devereux. More recently, Tolkien walked through Shugborough from his army camp on Cannock Chase and wrote his first Middle-earth tales at his wife's cottage at neighbouring Great Haywood. Here in the gardens in 1750, Thomas's sister-in-law Elizabeth rode on the river in a Chinese sampan and read Durfey's novel Astray, imagining herself as one of the shepherdesses of the French idyllic landscape. She wrote to Thomas in French as Cher Bager, thanking him for her time by their own beautiful Lignon, the river where Astray lost her lover Celadon. The Shepherd's Monument stands by the river. It's a place for contemplation, with the enigmatic relief of Poussin Shepherds and its cryptic inscription. Snee Davis wrote in his poem addressed to Thomas Hanson, Where now the dance, the lute, the nuptial feast, the passion throbbing in the lover's breast, life's emblem here in youth and vernal bloom, but reason's finger pointing at the tomb. Yet, while thou mayst enjoy and love the bower, with soul sedate above the passing hour. The shepherdess's smile reveals the soul sedate. Death might be inescapable, but reason and wisdom teach us eternal truth. 
The cipher inscription is meant to add mystery, but this is an 18th century serio ludi, a serious game. The letters almost certainly stand for the Latin phrase Orator ut omnia sunt vanitas et vanitas vanitatum. This isn't the Latin Bible, but a literal translation into Latin of the English Bible. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Thrusting in the world of chance and change and in worldly wealth and worldly culture is vanity. In Arcadia, we're not concerned with such vain things. We live a life in harmony with nature, which is both changeable in its matter, Adonis, and eternal in its forms, Venus. Some years later, Thomas had a statue of Adonis as god of vegetation in his greenhouse. He showed it to the botanist Joseph Banks by candlelight, saying, There's a grace, sir. Believe me, the Venus of Medici's is clumsy to it. Across the river, there used to be ruined columns. Sneed Davis, who knew more of Thomas's travels than anyone else, wrote that there were imperfect pillars to counterfeit the remains of antiquity. The architect could not perform his part satisfactorily without finishing the whole. Then comes Mr. Anson with axes and chisels to demolish as much of it as taste and judgment claimed. The ruins would have reminded Thomas of Palmyra and the fallen relics of ancient cities he had visited. The Chinese house, based on drawings made on George Anson's visit to China, might seem out of place. But this is part of the same theme. Inspired by the descriptions of the island of Tinian in Anson's voyage, the Chinese and anglo chinois garden became the ideal of a garden that was in harmony with nature. Facing the Shepherd's Monument across the river is Kuli Khan, Thomas's Persian cat, perhaps a presiding genius of the place. In Thomas's time, the park was open to passing shepherds and shepherdesses, a place where animals were safe from hunting and shooting. An anonymous poet, possibly William Mason, wrote, to every creature that the vital air sustains is Anson's kind benevolence extended. Never here was heard the hunter's barbarous shout or clamorous horn to fright the peaceful shades or murdering gun to stain the hospitable fields with blood. Entering the house, the drawing room and library, we are led into a deeper understanding of the Arcadian Testament. This is more than an expression of taste and exotic fashion. Here in the drawing room we have round the walls a series of large Capriccio paintings. They show the ruins of cities and temples in which people are living detached from the world that has collapsed around them. On the ceiling we have this wonderful plaster reproduction of Guido Reni's painting Aurora. This is Apollo in the Hours, riding through the sky. On the four walls are plaster roundels showing a series of faces. This is Isis. Thomas Anson was a member of the Egyptian Society for people who had travelled to Egypt in the early 1740s. The Society's symbol was the sistrum, the rattle of Isis, which we see here. For those familiar with the Roman novel, The Golden Ass, she represented the nature of all things, the secrets within nature. The society celebrated her birthday at the winter solstice. <clears throat> Opposite Isis is Serapis, her later Greco-Roman partner with a corn measure on his head. This is Midsummer. Between them we see a Maenad, a wild woman follower of Dionysus with vines in her hair, so this is autumn. On the remaining side, where we would expect to see a symbol of spring, we have this, Confucius. Thomas had this edition of Confucius in his library, Wisdom from the East. 
The drawing room tells us of time and change, the vanity of human civilizations, but also of the mysteries of nature and the universality of wisdom. On the other side of the house is the library. This is an intimate space, two rooms linked by an arch. One of the parts of the library is within the old house and the other half is in the new extension. This is the place where we retire to study, and here we see above us in the past work two groups of four faces. Four surround a figure of Minerva or Pallas Athene, goddess of wisdom, and the other surround a figure of Nike or fame. Here we have Demosthenes and Cicero, great orators of Greece and Rome. Philosophy is represented by Plato and Socrates, who teach us that everything flows from unity. And Euclid teaches the eternal laws of geometry. There are three poets. Sappho, the ideal poet of love. And finally, we have Theocritus and Virgil, the two key writers of the Arcadian tradition, reminding us that Arcadia is a linking theme of house and garden. The philosophy that lies behind this concept of garden and library is explained in the writings of Thomas Anson's friends, a very small group of people who shared this platonic view of the world when it was so unpopular and suspect. We can reconstruct a complete worldview from the words of these friends. James Harris, who passed on the story of Thomas on the Isle of Tenedos, promoted Greek philosophy as an antidote to the evils of materialism. In his three treatises, Thomas's copy is still on the library shelf, the author and his friend, Floyer Sydenham, walk in the woods, perhaps Wilton, where Sydney wrote his Arcadia. Here let us dwell, be here our study and delight, so shall we be enabled in the silent mirror of contemplation to behold those forms which are hidden to human eyes. But this is a new 18th century view of Plato, in which not only the eternal ideas are true, but matter is also good. Harris writes, there is therefore nothing ignoble and base which doth not participate of the good principle and hath not from thence its origin. Should you even instance matter, you will find even that to be good. And this is not the ancient cosmos. Harris writes of the vast systems of the Newtonian universe, of which everything is a part, and with respect to which not the smallest atom is either foreign or detached. Not the smallest atom is foreign or detached. This is a holistic universe. This has human moral implications. And this new vast universe is formed according to the laws of divine harmony. This was Newton's quest. Newton himself wrote, to some such laws, the ancient philosophers seem to have alluded when they called God harmony and signified his actuating matter harmonically by the God pans playing upon a pipe. The same laws, Newton and his 18th century followers believed, guided every aspect of nature, including colour. There might even be colour music, as Count Algarotti wrote, translating sound into colour, expressing feelings in the combinations of colour, just as nature does. Elizabeth Carter translated Algarotti's book, Sir Isaac Newton's Philosophy Explained for the Use of the Ladies. The concords of a piece of purple and scarlet will raise the passions of love, pity, courage and anger in our souls. Thomas Anson never showed any interest in conventional religion. Some of his friends, like the Platonist James Harris, were devout Anglicans. Others, like Athenian Stuart, the architect, and his composer friend Anthony and Camel, were Roman Catholics. Shugborough's message is philosophical. Its truths are universal. The imaginal Arcadia might embrace Staffordshire, Greece, and China. 
if we can be aware of these divine laws in nature, see that everything is an emanation from the divine and experience the world in reason, sense and imagination, we can discover Arcadia in the world around us. Lord Shaftesbury, James Harris's uncle, had inspired his readers to look beyond the artificial formality of their gardens and find truth in the wilderness. He wrote in The Moralists in 1709, The wilderness pleases. We seem to live alone with nature. We view her in her inmost recesses and contemplate her with more delight in these original wilds than in the artificial labyrinths and feigned wildernesses of the palace. In the 1750s, these 18th century Platonists begin to rediscover Arcadia on their doorstep. Not only a pristine wilderness, but a still living Arcadian culture in Wales. Thomas Gray had already written the first two parts of his poem, The Bard, A Pindaric Ode, but it was hearing the blind harper John Parry, harper to Sir Watkin Williams Wynne, play Welsh music at Cambridge in May 1756 that inspired him to complete it. He wrote to William Mason, Mr. Parry has been here and scratched out such ravishing blind harmony, such tunes of a thousand-year-old, with names enough to choke you, as have set all this learned body a-dancing. This was a turning point in the history of Arcadia. Of the few travellers who ventured into Wales in the 1750s, three were of Thomas Ansel's circle. Lord Littleton, Thomas himself, and his friend, Benjamin Stillingfleet. Stillingfleet was one of the four friends to whom Thomas left annuities in his will. He contributed to the first biography of Handel, which compares the great composer's understanding of the sublime to the oratory of Demosthenes. His book, The Principles and Power of Harmony, published just before his death in 1771, argues that the music that moves us most is the most simple and natural. The style he found in Handel and his own favourite Tartini, it echoes the lost music of the ancient Greeks, which he says was uncommonly touching and capable of producing any effect almost within the limits of possibility. Perhaps such pristine music could be found in Wales. Thomas Hansen died at his London house, 15 St. James Square, built and decorated in the Grecian style by Athenian Stuart, on the 30th of March, 1773. The botanist Thomas Pennant wrote, He was happy in his life and happy in his end. I saw him about 30 hours before his death, listening calmly to the melody of the harp, preparing for the momentary transit from an earthly concert to an union with the angelic harmonies. The harpist was almost certainly the young Edward Jones, a protégé of Thomas Pennant. Jones also worked with Thomas Anson's composer friend, Anthony Camel. Ten years after Thomas's death, Edward Jones visited Shugborough and gathered subscribers for his important book, The Musical and Poetical Relics of the Welsh Bards. Here in the list of subscribers, we have the surviving members of the Anson family and many of Thomas's friends, including Camel and Athenian Stuart and many of the local gentry. It must be about this time that a codestone druid was placed on the ruins by the river a druid in Arcadia. The message of Thomas Anson's Arcadian Testament is vastly more urgent today. This is no mere fashion or fancy. These people were trying to promote an attitude to nature and the world which is directly in contrast to the materialism and deism of the time, and all this several decades before Thomas Taylor began promoting Platonism in the Romantic Age. Shagborough reveals that there is truth in Arcadia. If we can change our perception, 
turn from looking out at an environment around us to knowing that the world without is united with the world within, the imaginal Arcadia can be reunited with the real landscape. This is a world in formation, drawn, we might say, by the celestial Venus. Sometimes we share in its creation, perhaps without realising. Are we returning to Arcadia, or is Arcadia returning to us? Greville Lindop writes in his Shagbra Eclogues, This is the garden's secret door, the way we enter and we leave, by pathways we cannot conceive, this is the dark secret of the garden. <laughs>